Okay, welcome everyone to the final panel of the Platypus Affiliated Society's Summer American Revolution series. The Platypus Affiliated Society um, is an organization dedicated to hosting the conversation on the left about the death of the left. Um, it was founded uh, in 2006, and it organizes reading groups, public fora, research, and journalism focused on problems and tasks inherited from the old, 1920s to 30s, new, 1960s, 70s, and post-political, 1980s, 90s left for the possibility of emancipatory politics today. You can find our online virtual reading groups and events at platypus1917.org forward slash virtual. We have a monthly open submission journal, The Platypus Review. If you would like to submit an article or perhaps a response to this series, please email editor at platypus1917.org. You should also check out our podcast, Shit Platypus Says, uh, for your dose of the commentary on the commentary on the left. Um, today, as the final installment of our American Revolution series, we have brought all of our lecturers together um, to have a panel discussion. Um, it will consist of short presentations by each of our lecturers, a bit of discussion amongst them, and then we'll open it up to audience Q&A, and that will be kind of um, the majority of the time uh, that we have here today, hopefully, will be Q&A. If you would like to ask a question following the panelists' remarks, you may either write your question in the Q&A box, and I will read them out loud, or if you would like, you can raise your hand using the raise hand function. Um, and you will be recognized to say your question or comment um, aloud. Um, uh, I will introduce the panelists now very quickly in the order that they will speak. Um, first is James Vaughn. Um, uh, he gave our lectures on the American Revolution in the early uh, British colonial period. Um, and he is a professor at the University of Texas. Uh, next is Christopher Coutrone. He is the founder of the Platypus Affiliated Society, and he gave our lectures on Thomas Jefferson's 1800 revolution and the Gilded Age. Uh, then Pam Nogales, also a founding member of Platypus um, and a recent PhD in American history, gave our lecture on uh, Jacksonian democracy. She will speak next, followed by Spencer Leonard, um, Spencer, I forget what university you're at right now, but he is a member, longtime member of Platypus. University uh, of Virginia. University of Virginia professor. Um, and he gave our lecture on the Civil War and Reconstruction. Um, finally, uh, Reed Cotless, longtime member of Platypus and um, the Socialist Party USA, uh, who gave our lecture on 19, the 1930s and 40s American communism. Uh, so without further ado, uh, James, take us away. Thanks, Aaron. <clears throat> um, I was trying to think about what to say, and I guess I want to make two comments, one on the series as a whole, and one in particular on the Constitution of the United States. Um, on the series as a whole, uh, I hope what's come across is not simply that the American Revolution was a bourgeois revolution, and that the history of the United States is a history of the bourgeois revolution and its crisis in capitalism. But really, I hope what also has come across is that in some broad sense, America is the revolution. What do I mean by that? America is the revolution. Um, as a kid, um, elementary school, high school, I was taught something that a lot of uh, subsequent professors and now colleagues in academe have tried to disabuse me of, but I actually think that I owe a lot to teachers when I was a kid. And what they always taught me was that the America is not a country and it's not a people, it's an idea, right? That was always something that was conveyed to us, at least I think to people of my generation in, in elementary school and high school, America is not a people, but an idea, right? And that idea in essence is that people individually and collectively should be able to freely determine the course of their own lives, that they should be able to set the course of their own life individually, and that they should be able to freely associate and cooperate with others to collectively determine the course of their own lives, to do things together 
that they could not achieve on their own. And that all the United States was, really as a political entity, was simply a framework for allowing that self-development of people, both individually and together. And that it had really no inherent geographic or, or certainly no ethno-national boundaries whatsoever. And I think hopefully this lecture series has conveyed that, America as the revolution, America as an idea. The other thing I wanted to address was the US Constitution. Um, the reason why I wanted to address this is after my lectures, uh, particularly after my second lecture, I got a question from two or three people asking why, why I had spent a lot of time trying to counter the so-called progressive narrative. That is that 1776 was a radical popular revolution from below and 1788, that is the ratification of the constitution was a kind of counter-revolutionary elite revolution from above. And I sought to counter that narrative because even if people are unaware that it's a progressive narrative, um, they rehearse it all the time today. You hear all the time, it's this 18th century framework. We're stuck in the past. Um, uh, uh, a good friend of mine um, uh, 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 from France often says that, 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 oh, Americans sound like religious fanatics. They're constantly talking about the founders and the constitution in a kind of religious sense. It's like they're walking with Jesus or something, or, or Moses has come down from Mount Sinai with these tablets, the constitution. The thing to say in response to that is, of course, you know, the Ten Commandments don't, not, none of the Ten Commandments say that people can later alter these commandments, right, <laughs> through a consensual deliberative process, right? So the Constitution can always be amended. But more importantly than that, I want to say that it's vital to realize that the Constitution is the revolution within the revolution. The Constitution is the living, continuing, permanent revolution. And just to talk about it with some historical specificity, right? When the Constitutional Convention begins in Philadelphia in 1787, it's important to understand that um, what's the power on which it's based? How can this constitutional settlement take place? Well, if you recall back to the lectures during the British Imperial Crisis and during the American Revolution, the legitimate existing state institutions of the British Empire fell away. And they were replaced by these popular institutions that emerged from society itself, committees of correspondence, committees of safety, militias, these types of things. And they gave rise to an alternative revolutionary structure of government, which gave rise to the independent states, which had Republican forms of government. And then they confederated in articles of confederation. But that system had problems. And therefore, by 1787, there was a decision to create a new form of federal government, new form of union. And those now independent Republican states sent delegates to Philadelphia to do that. But when those delegates decided they couldn't simply just recreate the Articles of Confederation, but they had to abandon it all together and create an entirely new federal government, it didn't go back to the state governments to be approved. Not at all. And this is vital to realize it goes back to conventions in all of the states where people, the majority in most of the states, where the majority of adult males in most of the states will be able to vote. Why did they do that? Not send it to state governments, but send it back to ratifying conventions in all 13 states. They did that because the revolutionary constituent power that, cr that brought about the American Revolution and created those independent states because a new framework of government was being created. That revolutionary constituent power, had you had to go back to the source when you were creating this new framework of government, the constitution, this new federal government and the state governments within it and this tripartite division of power in the federal government between the legislative, judiciary, executive, you had to return it to the source the revolutionary constituent power, the constituting, reconstituting power, which was the people themselves who had brought about the revolution and had to approve the constitution. And so what's so important to understand is the constitution is the return to that revolutionary constituent power to make a new fundamental law and framework of government, which is the United States of America as it emerges in 1788. And that revolutionary constituent power is embodied in the Constitution. 
And that constitution sets up a framework where every two years there'll be a congressional election and obviously every four years a presidential election. And at that time, at those times, what you have to realize during those election years is that revolutionary con constituent power, that revolutionary constituent power is coming back to life. And people are again determining the fate of their government and their collective life together. And so elections are always gonna be riotous, wild times, right? And it's not just 2020, it's not just 2016. They said it about Reagan, they said it about Nixon, they said it about FDR, they said it about TR, they said it about Abraham Lincoln, they said it about Andrew Jackson, they said it about Thomas Jefferson. I cannot emphasize enough, the revolution flares up again every time there is a national election every two years for Congress, every four years for the president. And we are living in a moment of the revival of revolutionary constituent power. And it is a moment of the people having to determine their lives. And it is a moment of the people set against one another, in some sense, in revolution. And in the, if the left can't basically take up the mantle of that revolutionary constituent power and can't do something with it, bring about the transformation from capitalist to socialism, it's no one's fault at all but the left's. It's not the fault of the Constitution and the framework of government put in place, and it's not the fault of the American Revolution. Thanks, James. Sorry, Chris, Chris you're next. Okay. Um, well, I'm very pleased that James laid that out because it helps me say what I want to say, um, which is that what has emerged, um, perhaps intentionally, perhaps only semi-intentionally from the series of lectures so far, is uh, if we think about how it's been broken down, then we are talking about the way that the American Constitutional Republic and democracy have been reconstituted several times in the course of its history. And we are talking about the emergence of the problem of capitalism and the problem of politics and the relationship between state and society in that process. And so the first lecture that I gave, which was on the Jeffersonian revolution, um, that phrase, of course, uh, kind of uh, elides a a difference between uh, Thomas Jefferson's participation in the 1776 American Revolution and then his electoral revolution of 1800. So I wanted to say something about that. Um, so you can say that the first political party in the United States is Jefferson's Democratic Republicans running for office in 1800 and that he understood this as a renewal of the original Revolutionary Party, perhaps small P party instead of capital P party, in the original 1776 revolution, namely the Committees of Correspondence that James mentioned. However, um, the lecture that followed mine, uh, Pam Nagalis's lecture on Jacksonian democracy, uh, really traces the emergence of the first modern political party, not only in American history, but perhaps in world history, the Democratic Party of Andrew Jackson. The Civil War and Reconstruction are incomprehensible without thinking about the uh, new Republican Party that emerges in the 1850s and that uh, wins the election of 1860, precipitating the Civil War and precipitating a revolution. Um, the lecture that I gave last in the series uh, was on the Gilded Age and on the emergence of socialism as a mass political force in the United States, which, however, was unable to realize um, such a revolutionary transformation of American politics and society. And my point there, uh, and I think that Reed's lecture uh, that followed mine, is that uh, socialism succumbed to progressivism, to progressive liberal capitalism. Uh, and that, of course, is what's behind uh, both the failed election of 1912, the campaign of Theodore Roosevelt as a progressive, but also 
what's behind the ultimate success of FDR and the Democratic Party and the new Democratic Party and new configuration of American politics with FDR through the New Deal coalition when he's elected in 1932. And in many respects, we still live in that system, um, not fundamentally modified uh, or overthrown, I should say, by the Reagan revolution of 1980, uh, but only modified. Um, so indeed, Right? We're thinking about politics and the relationship between politics and society and how much more problematic the relationship between politics and society becomes as a function of capitalism. And so the narrative we've been telling is of, of what might be perceived as a divergence between society and politics uh, as a function of capitalism and as a function of the transformations of the American political party system over the course of the history of the United States. And we are perhaps living through um, yet another transformation of the political party system in the United States, or at least a crisis of that political party system. And that's signaled by not only Donald Trump, but also by Bernie Sanders. And the ghost of American socialism stalks this crisis uh, precisely in the way that uh, Bernie Sanders invoked uh, also through his own uh, personal political history as a new left activist, the older history of American socialism, the Socialist Party of America, Eugene Debs, even while he has mounted an attempt to repair the New Deal coalition Democratic Party politics uh, in the United States, first in 2016 and again in the primaries of 2020. Not, not to win the nomination or to win the office of the presidency, but rather to try to rally um, what remains of the New Deal coalition and progressive liberalism in the Democratic Party. And that he had to do that under the moniker of socialism is significant, even if it is misleading and false in fundamental ways. It's nonetheless significant that, again, the industrialization of the United States in the Gilded Age did not lead to socialist revolution in the United States, and yet we are haunted by the possibility that it could and should have. Um, and of course, the uh, lecture by Reed that followed mine uh, is, is all about uh, the folding of American socialism and the Communist Party that emerged out of the crisis of American socialism, the folding of that into progressive liberal capitalism in the 1930s Great Depression era as a function of uh, the FDR New Deal uh, settlement of American politics and society. So that's what my takeaway has been um, in terms of tracing a red thread through the series. And finally, I just want to remind uh, something that I said in the beginning of my Gilded Age lecture, um, which is that this is not a Marxist approach to American history necessarily. The, the narrative that I just laid out does not depend on, on Marxism. This is something that would be widely acknowledged by liberals, conservatives, um, that there was a crisis of American politics with the emergence of industrial capitalism in the United States, and that there was a fundamental shift in the relationship between politics and society that has put a question mark over the constitutional Republican order of American politics ever since the progressive era and ever since especially uh, FDR. And that we still uh, live with that question, the question of what kind of democracy is the United States, what kind of democratic republic, what kind of constitutional order is the United States. And it doesn't take much of a crisis. Uh, it, just a weakness of the major capitalist political parties to throw the whole system into question. And again, not only on the avowed left, but across the political spectrum, across all, all varieties of political thinkers in the United States, and for that matter, around the world. In other words, people are wondering about the US constitutional order and its political system around the world uh, in the last four years and again, with this election. 
And so that's the occasion for our, our lectures. Um, and uh, Marxism would have to make sense within that broader world historic narrative of the American Revolution and the Constitutional Republic that it gave birth to. Um, and again, it's not an accident that uh, rage was directed at the statues of American revolutionaries in this year. I've written about it in my Republicans and Riots article. Uh, it's a deeply ambivalent rage. It's not a simple rejection, but it's anger. It's anger at the failure of the revolution that we've been facing this year. Thanks so much, Chris. Pam? Thanks. Um, so I just want to clarify the, the purpose of my lecture, just to, to say, you know, in a pithy way, what it was supposed to get at. Um, so I, I wanted to trace the transformation of the Jeffersonian tradition in the United States um, through the first half of the 19th century, which, as Chris has just um, sort of pointed out, this divergence between maybe what I would say is the task of American politics at its revolutionary apex and the society, the direction of American society um, in the emerging capital relations and how these two things sort of pulled in different directions and how people made sense of the Jeffersonian tradition in this context. And my, my thesis was that, you know, there's, um, Democratic Party historians, including um, some people that may call themselves sort of Marxist type of historians, have drawn this thread between uh, Jefferson and Jackson and Lincoln, and specifically the birth of the Republican Party. And I just wanted to say, well, look, there's this transformation of the Jeffersonian tradition that happens outside of the party with important figures that if one considers oneself a Marxist, one should know about. I restored people that fought for the shorter working day, people that took Benjamin Franklin and Jefferson to mean that the shortening of the working day was the advancement of American freedom and the continuation of the revolution. Um, and I guess naively I thought that I would do that in order to sort of offer to you know, a new generation of, of, of people that would like to be Marxist or think about socialism, that within the first half of the 19th century, you can make sense of Jefferson and you can say, here's the inheritance of what could be American socialism, right? That you could trace the relationship between American socialism and Jeffersonian thinking. Um, and I did this through these figures and through these working men parties, et cetera. Um, so, but the problem, I guess, is that we, it's unclear to me, my comments are a bit meta. They're about platypus and the approach to history and where we find ourselves today. Because the problem, it seems, is that once upon a time in the beginning of platypus, in the early years of platypus, we thought that we were speaking to sort of liberal types, radlib types, that were part of the milieu of the left, that seemed to have a sense that history was important and that American revolutionary history was important and that we thought that this was kind of a missing piece from the new left tradition, that the, the new left tradition had sort of turned against this very important part of the bourgeois ideal, the bourgeois ideals, the revolutionary ideals. And somehow Platypus could put these in conversation and thus make sense of the inherited defeats of the left throughout the 20th century by saying these, these parts of the left don't speak to one another and, and, and look, we're, we're gonna, I was rereading um, Richard Rubin's presentation for ambiguities. And he says at one point, you know, uh, the ideal situation would be that Platypus has on the one hand, the Obama supporters and the other hand, the, the Spartacist League, and there would be less noise. And here we are in 2020. And what we have is the DSA and the New York Times. Um, and, you know, it makes me wonder who we're speaking to. Um, when we defend the legacy of Thomas Jefferson. 
um, it makes me wonder to what extent like people want to learn, like does a new generation of hopeful Marxists want to learn about the American Revolution? And if that's not the case, are we just talking to ourselves? Um, you know, I read um, Gregor Balsak's piece in the, uh, uh, the American Conservative. Um, and I thought, so is this, is this what we're going to do now? I mean, no, you know, I, I, it, was a, it was a fine article, but I felt like, so is this the only people that we can speak to? So it's, it's just raised a, like a large question about, you know, it, it does feel like a message in a bottle of some sort, but it seems to me to um, be sapped from the original kind of entry of my own interest in the bourgeois revolutions through platypus, which is this question of how to redeem this kind of um, like liberal uh, instinct, because that liberal instinct actually seems to be falling apart. And, you know, as, as shown by the New York Times, um, it's sort of, you know, they're, they're leading a kind of anti-historical um, revolt, a sort of counter-revolution against what we once thought was still potentially revolutionary, even in a kind of wishful thinking about the liberal tradition. So I'm not sure. Um, so yes, the American Revolution lives and you know, we continue, but it, it made me wonder about you know, what we're going to make of the legacy of the American Revolution for future generations and whether or not we're, we're speaking to ourselves. I, I did wanna end, I, I know maybe, I, I, sorry, I didn't see the time, but um, I did wanna end with this one sort of piece of history, which I always found really important. Um, it's, it's a, so, you know, the, the Garrisonians, the, the abolitionists in the mid 19th century, at one point considered disunion. Um, it came up uh, in, in 1837, the annexation of Texas and it flared up again in the Mexican American war. And, and it's sort of a continued tradition. And, you know, they throw the constitution, you know, Garrison burns the constitution, et cetera, uh, calls it a covenant with, with the devil, et cetera, and with death. And in 1845, Charles Sumner, who will become, you know, part of the Republican Party, and he's a radical, has an argument with Wendell Phillips, who supports disunion, and he's telling him, like, why he's wrong about this. And so I'm just going to quote this bit. Um, uh, so Sumner says to Phillips, take your place among citizens. These are the weapons of a citizen in this just warfare. You already support the Constitution of the United States by continuing to live under its jurisdiction. You receive its protection and owe it a corresponding allegiance. In simply refusing to vote or to hold office, you proceed only halfway under your own theory. You should withdraw entirely from the jurisdiction. You should sever the great vivis cable of the allegiance, not content yourself with cutting and snip it, the hum snipping the humbler courts by which some of your relations to the Constitution are regulated. But what new home will you seek? Where in the uttermost parts of the sea should you find a spot which is not desecrated by the bad passions of men embodied in acts and forces of government? And so I, you know, I think like if, if we're saying down the constitution and you know, topple George Washington, um, what home will the future socialists seek? And, and that seems to be the question, but I'm not sure if it'll register. So I will leave it at that. Thanks so much, Pam. Spencer? Hi. Um, I didn't prepare anything, but I was just thinking about the, um, the question of you know, not producing a Marxist history of, of America, uh, but viewing Marxism in light of the American Revolution. And I think that um, my talk really raised that question uh, to the highest uh, direct or most immediate, uh, immediately obvious pitch. Uh, because Marx was a figure in that discussion, but the purpose was not to endorse 
the American Civil War in light of Marx, but rather to see Marx in a figure in the as a figure in the light of the American Revolution. Uh, something which I pointed out, Marx was uh, perfectly willing to do, uh, willing to, to the way he himself framed matters. Um, this is partly because uh, many of the writings that I discussed uh, were Marx's contributions to American debates in American newspapers, uh, where he was writing for no party, uh, but also the way I discussed uh, the formation of international socialism in the, um, it, as a consequence, really, of the American Civil War internationally. Um, and this is something that has been fudged in the history of socialism. Uh, you will commonly find Stalinist lies about this, which I don't, you know, really want to go into the question of the motivation for it. Uh, but you know, the 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 extremely silly notion uh, that an uprising in Poland was the occasion for the formation of international socialism. Uh, the occasion for the formation of the first international is unmistakably as discussed by uh, Karl Korsch, uh, but simply internationally understood, recognized a fact uh, in the light of the US Civil War and the imperial attempts to overthrow the American Republic uh, in conspiracy with the Confederacy. So what are we, and, and Marx chides his French and English uh, so-called liberal counterparts and leftist counterparts, socialist counterparts, people like LaSalle, people like Proudhon, uh, and many others for their uh, discounting of the significance of the American Civil War and repeatedly um, quotes, translates at length uh, Americans into to German and into the wider European public sphere without comment. Um, in other words, letting them uh, speak for the international revolution. For instance, one entire article that he publishes in, in German is just a translation of a speech by Wendell Phillips about the necessity uh, for the escalation of the American Civil War to a people's revolutionary war. Uh, which he thinks is uh, on the verge of happening in the summer of 1862. And I quoted at full length uh, Marx's address to uh, Abraham Lincoln congratulating the people of America on his reelection, in which he describes the epoch of modern revolution opening with 1776 and renewing in the course of the American Civil War. And what he's saying there is that the project announced in the 18th century was, the, in a sense, as well as, I'll put it this way, the American Revolution was the final mountain for imperialist counter-revolution to climb. It was the, the, the counter-revolution of the coup d'etat of 1851, or that we associate with that, uh, could not be complete so long as the American Revol Republic stood. And the Mexican-American War, the kind of counterpart to 1848 in the United States was ambivalent, whether it was an extension of an empire for liberty, or an empire for slavery. Uh, and therefore, its aftermath really uh, brings on the crisis that leads to the Civil War over that very question. And so the formation of this vast territorial uh, expanse that is the United States, this continental country, uh, this um, 
this economic powerhouse is a project of revolution or it's in the balance in the 1850s uh, in the wake of, of the Mexican-American War. And the question of the vitality of the revolution can't be adjudicated in terms of typical notions of, of um, bourgeois and socialist revolution when we look at the American Civil War. The American Civil War can be viewed as some kind of late bourgeois revolution, but ultimately that is inadequate. Uh, and that's what um, I was trying to signal by talking about the American Civil War as an event which stood, well, the Union cause in the American Civil War that stood against international counter-revolution and turned that tide. And in some ways, uh, the question of the ambivalence of that uh, in terms of the institution of a society that in many ways involved uh, labor forms that were worse than slavery, uh, etc., and the crisis of international socialism uh, are bound up together in the question of the destiny of, of the American Revolution. Um, the ambivalence, in a sense, of the victory in the 1860s. Um, and, and, and so I, I think that uh, when we look at, at even the history of Marxism, the foundational documents in the history of Marxism, uh, you can see that Chris's point about, in a sense, raising the issue of where does socialism stand in relation to the American Revolution is the question Marx himself is asking. Uh, and this is most clearly stated in the first inaugural address to the, to, to the inaugural address of the First International, where Marx is saying the question of political power, the necessity of proletarian political power, is raised by the American Revolution and is a task that has been placed by the American Revolution on the table of English trade unionists and French anti-imperialists, uh, the main constituents at that time of the First International, um, that they cannot conceive their tasks uh, in uh, simply uh, social terms, but, but must uh, take up the question ultimately of proletarian political power. Um, so uh, I want to, to point that, that's, that's why I took the attack that I did, uh, which was to say that from, in its essence, I think more clearly um, even uh, than the 18th century American Revolution, uh, the American Rev the American Civil War, properly understood, though never understood in this way, is a moment in the unfolding of world revolution. Um, and I will, uh, and, and, and that, and, and, and the question of the reconstitution of that republic. The last thing I'll say is this, which is that for the revolutionaries at that time, the, as hard to imagine as it is, they see no, in a sense, bottom to the potential of, of imperial regression. Um, that the, the revolution of 1848 for all liberals, not for, or not for all liberals, but commonly for liberals, questioned the significance of the modern revolution itself, threw the, it into question. Uh, the revolution of 1848 threw into question the significance of 1789, and the American Revolution is a continuation of that questioning. Uh, could the legacy of the 18th century be... Um, in, in a sense, slave empire. And I 
you know, while I described uh, the American Civil War as a, as a checking of imperial counter-revolution, uh, I think that over the course of the 1850s and 60s, Ingalls has a, has a, has a great uh, retrospective where he says, you know, when we were in exile in the 1850s, it seemed like imperialism would last for a thousand years. Um, and that question of, in a sense, you know, is there, um, you, know, I, you know, you could put it this way, that Marx was hopeful, or it's a hopeful statement when he, when he argues that the coup d'etat of Louis Bonaparte returns the state to its core of rule by force, that it returns the state to, in a sense, it's, you know, to, to the character of the ancient pharaohs. Um, because really the, 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 the task of, of, of freedom as made clear in the 1860s is one uh, of socialism or something worse than slavery as an entire civilizational inheritance of, uh, of human history. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Spencer. Reed? Thanks. Can you, can you hear me? I didn't ch test my mic. Okay. Thanks. Um, so I wanted to, um, to address a potential ambiguity my lecture may have left open, namely that communist parties, um, the Communist Party USA's claim on the legacy of the American Revolution was made by leaders of the communist movement's right wing, um, specifically Jay Lovestone and then Earl Browder. And hence that any such claim should be considered a right-wing gesture. The American Revolution should not be consigned to Browderism. This point cannot be emphasized enough. Lenin's assessment in his letter to American workers, which was obviously referring to Eugene Debs among others, should be taken seriously, which is why I quoted it um, both in the opening and closing of my lecture and why I'm going to quote it again. Namely, um, he said that the American people have a revolutionary tradition, which has been adopted by the best representatives of the American proletariat, who have repeated, repeatedly expressed their complete solidarity with us Bolsheviks. That tradition is the war of liberation against the British in the 18th century and the Civil War in the 19th century. What I hoped to demonstrate was that despite Lenin's judgment in 1918, the revolutionary tradition was subsequently adopted by the worst representatives of the American proletariat, specifically the Communist Party under Browder's leadership. Although, as I also tried to emphasize, this adoption occurred in response to the exhaustion of and discontent with the third period orientation and the brief reconsideration of the United Front before the shift to the Popular Front in 1935. It was not specifically related to the embrace of the New Deal at first, nor to the later support of the war effort, although it did end up serving to justify both of these positions. The worst thing about Browder, his right wing character, as it were, was his total pliability with respect to the demands of the Stalinist common turn, even where this led to absurdly abrupt changes in tack and worse, to the liquidation of revolutionary socialism into the progressive capitalist statism of the Democratic Party. Ironically, to the extent that his legacy is remembered at all, it is usually condemned for the supposedly patriotic nationalist chauvinism of the Americanism campaign, rather than its opportunistic vacillation between anti-fascism, both the ultra-left radicalism of the third period and the popular front style apologia for the Democratic Party as the last bulwark against the fascist menace and the anti-imperialism of the Hitler-Stalin pact period, um, parameters that have defined the degenerative tra trajectory of the left up to the present and presumably will continue to do so for the indefinite future, unfortunately. Browder's Americanism didn't prevent James Cannon and the Trotskyist Socialist Workers Party from also claiming the American revolutionary tradition, 
although they rightly or wrongly were not nearly as exuberant about it as either the Lovestoneites in the late twenties or the Browderites in the thirties and forties. But as much as we might admire Cannon, it's not as if the Socialist Workers' Party managed to become the kind of revolutionary leadership it aspired to provide. It never even really came close. Cannon and his party may have been the best representatives of the American proletariat in this period, but that sadly isn't saying much other than to laud the consistency of their attachment to the critical perspective of Trotsky in spite of its practical impotence as a political force. And to what measure this had to be paid for with delusion is certainly an open question. And of course, even that consistency turned out to be impermanent. In my lecture, I had hoped to raise the question of why today or in the future, the best representatives of the American proletariat, whoever they may turn out to be, and of the world proletariat as a whole for that matter, should adopt the revolutionary tradition, not of 1776 and 1865, as they will inherit this legacy whether they want to or not, they must. I wanted to raise the question rather of whether they should adopt the revolutionary tradition of Marxism in spite of its failure, degeneration, and disintegration. I hope to indicate that it is not the legacy of the American Revolution which must justify itself to the working class, but the legacy of Marxism, and that the latter will only be able to do so if it proves itself adequate with respect to the former legacy, as pointing the way forward to the next act of the great drama, to the inevitable third revolution whose necessity flows from the unresolved crisis of history beginning in 1848. The question of whether Browder was right or wrong to embrace the legacy of 1776, of whether such an embrace is therefore right wing or not, is wrong to begin with and can only be answered wrongly. The problem with Browder is that he neither lived up to this legacy nor to that of Marxism. He failed even as a bourgeois revolutionary, let alone a proletarian socialist. His party played no leading role in advancing the American Revolution towards socialism or anything else. But that no more invalidates the task of further advancing the American Revolution beyond its crisis in capitalism and of redeeming that legacy than it invalidates the task of proletarian socialist revolution as understood by Marx and Lenin. Browder fell beneath the standards not only of Marx and Lenin, but also Lincoln and Jefferson. As such, he represented the failure and liquidation of Marxism that was affirmed under Stalin in the name of Marxism. And he likewise succumbed to the failure and liquidation of the bourgeois revolutionary heritage in capitalism, precisely in embracing it while dutifully accepting Stalin's capitulation to and integration into capitalist counter-revolution. Marxism must not serve to justify this liquidation of the bourgeois revolution, or it thereby liquidates itself and its own aspirations as well. Rather, this legacy will only be put to rest in its redemption, whatever that may ultimately require. This task will remain before humanity so long as we survive. If Marxism will not serve this redemption, fidelity to Marxism, no less than to the American Revolution itself obliges us to ask, what will? That's all I have, thanks. Thank you so much, Reed. Um, I'm gonna encourage us to move straight to the Q&A, but if people have responses that they want to give, we can do that first. Does anybody want to respond or can I go to questions? Okay, great. I'm going to move forward to questions. So first we have uh, Richard who um, raised his hand and will give his question live. Richard, you're on. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so Pam, since Pam quoted me, I just wanted to say that when I wrote that piece, that since then I think that there's been a general political degeneration. I mean, I was already speaking nostalgically when I spoke about liberals and Spartacists in 2009. 
and that since then there's been a deterioration in both. And I agree with Pam's meta question about how that affects platypus. So I think that the general right-wing trend has subtle effects not only on liberals and the Sparts, but also on platypus. Um, so I had a couple of comments, and one of which is intended as somewhat of a provocation. So I'm curious, my general curiosity, and it was somewhat addressed by James in the first lecture, is the general emphasis in platypus is on the general continuity and unity of the bourgeois revolution. But of course, there are individual bourgeois revolutions. And I wonder to what extent you see differences as well as continuity specific to the American Revolution, both from those that preceded it, like the Anglo-Dutch Anglo revolutions and also perhaps the French Revolution succeeding it. But my fundamental provocation is that, that one of the dates that was set up in this whole series was an opposition was a question of, for example, 1619 and 1776. If we move to a period though that follows the period that was covered in this lecture, namely the Cold War, and one of Chris's comments, the quote from John F. Kennedy brought this up, but also some of the comments of Reed. What is the relationship? Couldn't you say that after 1945, the two dominant states that exist in the world were states that had, were born in revolution, the Soviet Union and the United States. However, in whatever deformed way they represented those revolutions. So is there not a way then that after 1945, the fundamental opposition in world politics begins to seem an opposition between 1776 and 1917? And so what is the relationship between those two dates and I think that goes to Reed's comments. I need to consider that before I can answer for a moment. Um, I don't know if anyone else has something to say. I uh, maybe have something um, in response to this. Uh, so I think that um, it came up in one of the preceding lectures, and I'm trying to remember for whom. It might have been Reed's lecture, that, uh, or it might have been Spencer, that in the 19th century, uh, the United States and Russia were seen, however differently, as uh, resources wellsprings for the counter-revolution. Russia as a political force um, of reaction in Europe and the United States as a kind of pressure release valve for the European proletariat to emigrate to. Um, and so, you know, we could say that uh, also along with Hegel, uh, in his introduction to the philosophy of history, he observed that uh, Russia and America were not in his consideration because they were the lands of the future. Um, and he left that very unspecified what that meant. Um, but we might assume that he meant uh, they're the lands of the future of freedom, since that was the subject of, of his uh, lectures on the introduction to the philosophy of history. Um, and certainly uh, it immediately comes to mind that um, the counter position of 1776 and 1917 uh, featured for the new left. Uh, featured for the post-1945 left, uh, both the early new left and also figures who come out of the, the Trotskyist tradition, such as Raya Genevskaya, who did write a book on the spirit of 1776, after all, uh, precisely as a uh, Hegelian Marxist, uh, Marxist humanist. Um, so this has been in contention, uh, and it has been occasionally explicitly referenced as such, and perhaps, uh, you know, of course, the John F. Kennedy quote uh, from 1960 that I made um, in my uh, American Revolution on the Left public forum uh, panel discussion opening remarks. Um, but, of course, after the Cold War, uh, we don't have this juxtaposition any longer. We don't really have the juxtaposition of 1917 and 1776 
rather we're left with uh, what Christopher Hitchens called in the early days of Platypus, the last surviving revolution, the American Revolution, to which he uh, dedicated himself um, in his emigre status, his emigre new leftist who became an American citizen and became champion of American democracy and American uh, liberalism and, and, and of the American Revolution. Um, so finally, I would say that uh, I hope that we are not living in a completely different era now than when uh, Richard spoke and, and Ian and, and I spoke in 2009 on the Platypus Synthesis. Uh, that was right after the election of Barack Obama. I hope that um, we don't think that politics has qualitatively degenerated only with the election of Donald Trump. Um, I hope that we don't concede to that canard uh, because I think that that would be a, a serious mistake. Um, at the same time, at the same time, I do want to say something rather um, outlandish and provocative myself, which is to say uh, the 2020 election promises to be quite tumultuous. And after 2016, we already had the specter of what um, uh, James brought up. Um, secession has been raised since 2016. People have said, you know, now's the time perhaps for um, progressive liberal America to secede from conservative liberal America. Right? There, there has been that specter raised. And insofar as the results of the 2020 election might uh, occur under some cloud of doubt, the specter of civil war is raised. So I want to recall also from my uh, comments at our panel back in New York uh, in February of this year um, that the U.S. accomplishes through elections what in other countries requires civil wars. And in that respect, every election is a little civil war, however peacefully conducted. Uh, and that we are, we are looking at, at that uh, in a particularly extreme form in 2020, precisely because um, in many respects, the other party, the Democratic Party, has never quite accepted the election results of 2016. And it would be an irony of history if the Democrats did lead a new secessionist movement that precipitated another civil war after 2020. Um, Richard, can I answer your question to me by building on something Chris said, which is Chris brought up the Christopher Hitchens point, which is that the American Revolution is the last revolution still standing. Um, I want to go back to what I said about the Constitution and revolutionary constituent power. Um, your question about how does it differ from preceding revolutions. Um, the, the Dutch War of Independence against the Spanish Empire is undertaking by existing institutions, right? Existing political bodies. Um, there's a revolutionary constituent power in the English Civil War, English Revolution, mid 17th century, but ultimately it's defeated and rolled back. And the Glorious Revolution is undertaken by existing uh, uh, political order, by existing uh, uh, bodies. In the American Revolution, that revolutionary constituent power not only wins out, but it creates a new fundamental framework of government, i.e. the Constitution. It does not return to the existing bodies, the state governments. It returns to the source of itself, the revolutionary constituent power by holding popular conventions, by, by holding popular conventions. And the reason why I can't stress this enough is believe it or not, the majority of historians in the United States miss this. And what I mean by that is people talk about it as if though it's a union between states. No, that was the Articles of Confederation. The United States Constitution is a union between people. That's why Abraham Lincoln constantly calls it the People's Union. It is not a union between states. And basically, if we think about regime changes, it is the only revolution in which that successfully happens in the epoch of the classical bourgeois revolutions. A version of that happens in the French Revolution, but it itself ultimately collapses in restoration. So of the kind of classical era, the pre-capitalist era of bourgeois revolution, it's only in the American Revolution that the revolutionary constituent power has that success in not only constituting itself, but reconstituting itself as a new regime and continuing on. 
into modernity. And really, there's no other revolutionary regime that, that reestablishes it, itself. Uh, th there's no other regime that has that inheritance in the world today. There's no other regime that isn't founded by the existing bodies of the previous regime, that, but is actually founded by the, re the, pe the revolutionary people themselves. And in that sense, it's unparalleled. Can I just add to that, um, which is, you know, w what is distinctive about the American Revolution is, is you know, if we want to talk about different bourgeois revolutions, if you want to put it in those terms, is the fact that it survives into the 19th century. Um, the fact that it, it, that it becomes this refuge for Europe, that it becomes this refuge for reaction, from reaction, uh, a character that it has that is then uh, amplified or intensified uh, by the defeat in 1848 and the massive waves of immigration of, of revolutionaries, of, of politically motivated immigration uh, in the 1850s. Um, the question of the relationship between the fact that it survived the global counter-revolution earlier to the fact that it proved through immense storm and drong equal to its crisis, to the crisis of the 19th century, is a very profound historical question, right? In other words, what was it about the durability, the deep connection of the American people to the Constitution, to the inheritance of the revolution that led them to fight uh, so desperately to preserve the Union uh, and to, to meet the crisis of the 1840s uh, in the way that they did to, to preserve that revolution in some important critical sense. Uh, is a question that cannot be posed with reference to any other revolution. Uh, and it, in, 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 in 1776, in its endurance and in its crisis and in some meaningful sense, the survival of that crisis, it is international. It is a inherently part of the world revolution. Just, I uh, just wanted to address um, <laughs> this question of the apparent conflict between 1776 and 1917 and the revolutions that those dates represent that sort of defines the later 20th century, the second half of the 20th century, in other words, the Cold War, um, which is that, you know, I mean, really what that, that apparent conflict represents is the elision of the underlying problem that kind of haunts both the United States and the Soviet Union and really the whole world during the period, which is that um, it's essentially elision of what the problem of capitalism actually is. In other words, the what was the problem of the 19th century? What was the problem defining the period between 1776 and 1917? Of course, the 20th centuries, um, especially specifically the second half of the 20th century, or really since 1919, you could say, the regression of historical consciousness in this period um, is in a sense summarized in the fact that capitalism is now simply identified with bourgeois society rather than being understood as the self-contradiction of bourgeois social relations and of the bourgeois revolution. Um, so the United States in representing capitalism, not as a, an expression of the problem in this revolution, not as a positive term, you know, understood as a positive term rather than as a critical concept, which is where the term was introduced in the first place to serve as a critical concept. Um, the United States in the Cold War represents capitalism as the culmination, the fulfillment, the, the truth of the bourgeois revolution, its, its, its historical importance is understood as capitalism. 
rather than capitalism being understood as in a sense the self-destruction of that revolution significance and the crisis of, of that, that process. Um, likewise, the Soviet Union is understood in its, in a sense, anti-capitalism, its opposition to the capitalist pole of, the, of this polarization of the world, um, not as the overcoming of capitalism through its self-transformation, but as, in a sense, um, separation from and opposition to capitalism from without. But in that, in, at the same time, of course, what the Soviet Union actually represented was the liquidation of socialism into a particular form of capitalist statecraft, um, a particular way of managing capitalism um, in, within the context of its endurance in um, the defeat of the socialist revolution, um, accommodation to defeat. So I think, you know, I think the, the fact that this problem still hangs over us is, uh, you know, it's not simply the Cold War in a sense. Um, it's, the, it's the crisis of the regression of historical consciousness that, um, that made that war <laughs> necessary and that, tra and that continues beyond its, uh, beyond its end. So. Just wanted to respond to, um, I mean, there's another way of putting it, Chris, not that like, you know, the decline of liberal, um, I would say like liberal ideas um, is somehow like spurred it on by Trump, but maybe we um, misdiagnosed the character of liberals already as early as 2009. Meaning, you know, like what Richard is saying in the article is that this, the nature of social, I mean, it could be written out, the nature of social reality itself becomes increasingly opaque. And so the decline of Marxism is accomplished by simultaneous disintegration of bourgeois culture itself, the ground of which, the ground out of which Marxism emerged. So we thought that, you know, that was still alive, at least in 2009. And certainly um, the disorientation that happened under Trump maybe shows that that was not the case. Anyway, I don't, because I, I don't, you know, despite, I mean, Richard said what he said, but I just think that um, it's a real question. I think what we expected our intervention to be in public discourse in civil society when there was this liberal tradition and what we might imagine it to be now, certainly we're not going to be, you know, um, we're not going to be smarter versions of Christopher Hitchens. So. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm going to use my moderator privilege to ask a question since it's related to one that was asked by the audience, um, which is that it came up in Chris's Gilded Age lecture that America is the second international country um, in the world stage. Um, so Ian asked the question of, basically he says, uh, it's somewhat old fashioned to ask, but I'm wondering how people respond to the issue that socialism has always been historically weak in the US. And is this related to the American Revolution? It does appear that greater democracy in the US has made it such that parties like the SPD were not the right model. What is that issue? Is American civil society different? Is it constitutional or simply a deficiency in organizing? Um, and I found that uh, in the Kautsky reading group, I was very surprised to see Kautsky say that the Second International had thought at its inception that America would have one of the fastest growing parties. Um, and that this is halted uh, by the Haymarket Affair in 1886, the May 4th Affair, um, when suddenly public opinion basically sidelines the socialists um, completely. Um, and I was also struck by Spencer saying that there are, and Pam has pointed this out too, that a lot of these sort of revolutionaries and socialists come to America in the 1850s, that the First International does seem to play some sort of role um, in uh, the American Revolution. Um, so I also wanted to kind of, with Ian's question, ask if Chris could clarify kind of, or maybe others, the relationship of the First and the Second International um, to the American Revolution and within America. Yeah, let me, um... Let me say that uh, there's an important parallel that's turned out to be the case this year between our two different summer activities, our summer reading group on Kautsky, um, on Kautsky's Marxism, and on Second International Marxism uh, more broadly, 
and this lecture series on the legacy of the American Revolution, uh, that they do uh, complement each other in a particular way. Now, when Kautsky said that the expectation of uh, the growth of American socialism um, taking off more rapidly uh, was, was contradicted or checked by uh, the reaction against the um, Haymarket uprising. Um, that's perhaps true in the 1880s, but by the end of the 1890s and the early 19 aughts uh, that had been reversed. And in fact, the Socialist Party of America did grow very rapidly. Um, and it was belated in comparison to the SPD. Uh, but in fact, their, their rapid growth are um, contemporaneous in the, in the late 1890s and early 19 uh, aughts. Um, so there's, you know, the comparative weakness of American socialism for instance, um, addressed by someone like Werner Sombart, uh, the SPD has a much more proportionally significant place in German society and politics in the same period than the Socialist Party of America does in that era. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't draw too sharp a distinction between the two. Um, because in the United States, the Socialist Party of America was not merely a sect. Um, it was not uh, marginal the way we might imagine. And I think that that uh, historical imagination is affected by later Stalinism, meaning uh, Stalinism starts the history of Marxism in 1917. And therefore, uh, the only significant socialist party in American history becomes the CPUSA, and specifically the CPUSA of the 30s and 40s, before McCarthyism, right? Um, and so our point would be uh, that, that this willful neglect and forgetting of the Socialist Party of America before World War I um, is tendentious in a particular way, is distorting in a particular way, and is uh, suppressing of history in a particular way. Um, and so I, I think that this false memory um, hides the question of socialism behind the question of progressive liberalism and progressive capitalism. Uh, because of course the Stalinists also claim that the New Deal is somehow um, a response to the pressure of American socialists or American communists, which is simply not true. Simply not true. Um, it's far less true in 1932 and 1933 when FDR takes office and implements the New Deal than it was in 1912 when Theodore Roosevelt ran as a progressive. Um, Theodore Roosevelt running as a progressive was less a response to the growth of the Socialist Party of America um, than it is of a response to the growth of capitalism itself, to uh, the political crisis that the growth of capitalism itself um, brought about. Uh, so again, um, the left likes to claim that progressive liberal reforms are a response to the pressure of socialists or communists. Um, but that's really a rationalization for their own um, movement, uh, social movement activist pressure tactics on elected officials, uh, which is essentially the, the model adopted by the left ever since the 1930s uh, Stalinist era and continuing up through the new left and up to today. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that this, is, this came up during the Jacksonian lecture about the socialist in America. I mean, we have to sort of consider what we mean by the socialist, right? There are these, there are these um, sort of communal experiments. There are Fourierites, the Horace Greeley's New York Tribune, where dedicated Fourierites is like a major newspaper in the United States. There's Owen's uh, factory model that sits in the White House. There's a, a rather rich, um, I, I would say, civil society conversation and organization between 
reformers, uh, you know, what we might consider more sort of liberal reformer types, uh, labor reformer types, and socialists. Wendell Phillips himself, since he's come up in this lecture, um, in this conversation, defends the Paris Commune, um, their, their marches, uh, you know, through New York streets led by the communists in, in the 1870s. I mean, there's, there's a sort of buried history um, you know, which I <laughs> dedicated myself to uncovering because I wanted to understand what this what this was about. But um, and certainly the Lasallians are uh, are quite powerful already by the 1870s. Um, and you know, it, it raises the question of what the socialists are for when the 1877 Great Strike comes out. Um, it's like, are they going to lead? You know, what's going to happen? But you see American politics responding to it um, in political cartoons already because they feel the threat of an emerging sort of social movement uh, for socialism. So I think that Chris's like emphasis on how the Stalinists kind of rewrite the history of American socialism and they're like, you know, it's socialism after 1917 just elides this deep history, which is important to, to recognize the emergence of revolutionary socialism, which has to go through several phases and, and factional disputes and regroupments. I want to add something to this, which is not countered anything, but said sort of the reverse side of the coin, if you will. And it's, it's meant, I mean this as a provocation. Uh, I believe Chris raised this issue in his Gilded Age lecture. That is the possibility that socialism is the birth pangs of the second industrial revolution. Um, we, I don't know if we still read, but we used to read Eric Cobsbaum's historical uh, history of the 19th and 20th centuries and, and early date of some platypus. And there was something very provocative in, in, in his fourth book, The Age of Extremes, about the short 20th century from World War I and the Russian Revolution to the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. You know, Hobsbawm at the end of a long life is a Stalinist, as a member of the Communist Party of Great Britain, one of the overseers of the translation of the Marx-Engels collected works into English. He says in that book, in a kind of despairing moment, it may be it, that Marxism only took hold as a function of the transition to modernity. That is that, that and we do have to really raise that question, that, that Marxism or more broadly socialism really took root in only partially bourgeois areas of the world and not in the most fully bourgeois areas of the world. I'm not saying that to dismiss Marxism. I'm saying that as something that we, we need to countenance that possibility. I say that in the spirit of platypus, which, is, which, which we always talk about, which is to take nothing for, to concede nothing and to take nothing for granted. But we do have to confront the fact that Marxism may have just been the birth pangs of a transition to modernity. Socialism may have just been the birth pangs of a second industrial revolution. And that these things seem to have what life they did in only partially bourgeois areas of the world. And, and I offer that really in the sense of, as Chris and Spencer and Reed have emphasized here today, which is we're thinking about uh, we're thinking about Marxism in light of the American Revolution, not the American Revolution in light of Marxism. So I could just quickly follow up on that with James, and and also with what Pam said. Um, then America would be the great exception, uh, meaning that. Uh, the history of American socialism goes all the way back to the early 19th century um, and uh, does have a vital role in American uh, civil life and maybe an indirect role in American political life uh, all the way up through uh, World War I in a way that it doesn't really subsequently. Um, and in this respect, uh, you know, again, if we're, if we're going to say the American Revolution is the one that endures, that endures in the 19th century, right? It's not about enduring today, but enduring in the 19th century, um, that uh, not only liberal democracy is a political form, but uh, civil society, bourgeois civil society, uh, is particularly vibrant in the United States in the 19th century. Uh, all the way up through the Gilded Age. Um, obviously, there is a certain uh, brutality to the Second Industrial Revolution in the United States, but this doesn't contradict the fact that uh, the United States remains 
bourgeois society throughout that period. Um, and this is why uh, the question of progressivism, of a kind of progressive statism, um, is dated to either Woodrow Wilson or FDR. In other words, it's a fairly late development. Um, and uh, the vibrancy of American socialism uh, coincides precisely in the historical era of the 19th and early 20th century, in which you could say that civil society still had the advantage over the state and its politics. Um, and loses that purchase in civil society precisely uh, with the rise of um, a kind of statist progressive liberal capitalism, first with Woodrow Wilson through World War I, and then finally with FDR and the New Deal. The, the, the progressive politicians knew that that's what they were doing. I mean, that was part of the lessons that they learned from the Europeans. Um, yeah. This is why we handled the transition from the Civil War to the post um, Reconstruction era in exactly the way that we did, um, which isn't exactly about agonizing over the fact that the Republican Party was a party of capital. Uh, because the you know it, it, there there are issues as to um, of course the political resolution of of Reconstruction and 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 the fate of the freed slaves in the South, um, and but that's very much itself a a social question um, in over in the long durée of the nineteenth century in terms of the real fate of of Reconstruction in the South. Uh, but the issue was not really the direct development of the Republican Party into social, you know, into being a socialist party. That's really a, a, a misunderstanding of, of the political potentials. Thanks. Um, so we have a couple of shorter questions. They're kind of directed. I'm going to give them just one at a time so that we can deal with each of them. Um, so the first is in response to uh, Chris. Um, Chris said that uh, you could say the first party was Jefferson's Democratic uh, Republican Party. Um, so the questioner asks, aren't the British Whigs the first real party and Britain in the 18th century the first one party state? Um, I don't know if anybody wants to take that up. Or Chris, maybe you could clarify what you meant, why um, Jefferson's party? Well, okay, uh, I would imagine that perhaps uh, James could, could speak to that, but I would say um, he has to win the election of 1800 um, against a growing consensus among the ruling class um, in terms of uh, the, the John Adams administration and Alexander Hamilton and what becomes of federalism. Um, so he has to sort of mount a political campaign uh, that in the election of 1800 that perhaps uh, he didn't anticipate ever having to do uh, when the uh, constitution was ratified um, in 1788 and, and, or 1787 and 1788 and, uh, and, and the Washington administration subsequently. Um, and so it's, it's to raise the question of what a political party is, right? And it is the dominant party, by the way, um, until the, the crisis of that party that Pam addressed uh, with respect to its splitting and, and the rise of the new Andrew Jacksonian uh, Democratic Party. Um, and so that's why I distinguish between maybe the first political party, because the Federalists didn't have to be a political party. Um, and there really is no place for political parties in the American Constitution. There really isn't in, in its original conception. Um, it's, not, it's not set up to be a two-party system. It's set up to be a no-party system. And yet it, it becomes a party system first with this push to renew and, and, and properly interpret the Constitution uh, through the Jeffersonian Revolution of 1800, but
but then in a totally different way with the rise of Andrew Jackson's Democratic Party. Um, and so the, the question of um, the Whigs then, and it's interesting that the, that the party in the United States uh, that opposes the Andrew Jackson Democrats are the Whigs, call themselves the Whigs, and are precisely harking back to a kind of non-party uh, democracy, um, namely that of the uh, 18th century in, in the United Kingdom. Um, and so, you know, if, if we think of, I think it would be a little bit anachronistic to call 18th century Britain a one-party state in, in the sense of what we, what we uh, take that to mean. I think it would be more accurate um, to say that it's really a, a kind of a no-party state. Um, in the sense of modern political parties. But I don't know, James might have a completely different way of characterizing that. No, I'll just briefly endorse what Chris says and, and there in the sense with the, the it's, it is anachronistic to think of the Whig regime in 18th century Britain as a one party state. The Whig and Tory parties emerge in the late 17th century in and around the struggle between crown and parliament, but um, they are not, they're emphatically not what Pam talks about with the Democratic Party, that is a, a mass democratic party in the, it, 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 during the onset of capitalism. And they are not really even the democratic, republican, and federalist parties of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Um, and, and furthermore, insofar as one could even talk about the fact that the Whigs have something like a permanent control of the British state is because the monarchs prescribe Tories, meaning Tories are viewed as not as, not as lo loyal subjects, good defenders of the glorious revolution. So the early Hanoverian monarchs explicitly say, I don't care who win the parliamentary elections, um, the, the, the king's servants, because after all, remember, they are his majesty's leading servants, the government, they will be Whigs. And so really, therefore, um, everybody in some sense that's in government for most of the 18th century considers themselves a Whig because to be in government, right, one needs to be a defender of the Glorious Revolution and its principles. And so politics really becomes what's the content of that? What was the Glorious Revolution? What does it mean? What are its principles and the kind of ongoing development of society? So no, I, I would not call 18th century Britain a one party state in, in that sense. And, and just to complete it very quickly, uh, the American revolutionaries would have uh, uh, did think of themselves as Whigs right, as true Whigs against what they had thought had become the false Whigs that were dominant in Britain, right? Um, and, and in that sense, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, John Adams, for all of their later differences, would have thought of themselves as good Whigs against the bad Whigs of the British Empire. Um, so our next question asks, uh, wasn't the main difference between the Democratic Party coalition in FDR's day and today, the trading away of the Southern racist vote uh, who filled their shoes? And I think this is probably in response um, to Chris, you talking about Bernie trying to rally the um, FDR coalition. That's when the question came in. <laughs> this is why I emphasized in my talk, the fact that it's utterly forgotten that the Republicans were the Black Party. In other words, that's really the trade that occurs um, as a function of the Civil Rights Movement, um, which is that the Dixiecrats are abandoned in favor of the Black vote. Uh, so uh, the Dixiecrats it? go from the de Democrats to the Republican Party and the Blacks go from the Republican to the Democratic Party. So that's one. But, <clears throat> Oh, I see. So the question, I, the question is confusing. So the main difference between the Democratic coalition in FDR's day and the Democratic coalition of today is presumably, I see. Yeah, yeah. I tried to fill it in when I said it, but yeah. That's why, I, right. I, I mean, basically, I would say that the difference between the Democratic Party today and in FDR's day is that it has a black constituency that it didn't have when FDR was elected. You know, quite obviously. <laughs> but it, it had other ethnic constituencies. And when it becomes the party of the, the black vote, it does so uh, un, on an unchanged basis in terms of the way that it conducts politics. 
Yeah, because the black vote in the Republican Party wasn't really an ethnic constituency. It wasn't, but it was a, um, well, the Republican Party was simply not organized that way. But there was a black Republican patronage system, a very strong patronage system. Uh, they were given all sorts of jobs and, and offices in the federal bureaucracy throughout the United States. And Woodrow Wilson, when he's elected in 1912, uh, there's a kind of purge of the federal government of blacks. And part of that is seen in the segregation of Washington, D.C., which up to that point had not been segregated. Right. So, again, um, you know, people forget uh, Martin Luther King's father famously said he'd never vote for a Democrat. Uh, so our next question is from Harry Gindy. He asks, why doesn't Platypus start talking to the right since the Republican Party is ideologically bankrupt and since the new left is atrocious and undermining the country? But I think this is in response to Pam, what you said. Just, you know, it might be nice to give a sense of why. Um, you're despaired by the thought that perhaps the only people reading us are the readers of American conservatives. I think that's um, what the question kind of calls for. Well, um, I think in our statement of purpose, the very reason why we have an organization um, is insofar as we're interested in the history of the left and the possibility for socialism. So it's not about being, you know, sort of talking heads for an audience, you know, historians for a group of people that may care about the American Revolution that you know, we would do away with the goal of the organization if that were the case. Um, it's, but it's a real quandary. Um, how do we sustain the mission of the organization given that within civil society, um, there is a rejection of the bourgeois revolutionary ideals because then, you know, we do, unfortunately, come off as somehow, I guess, smarter kitchen types. I mean, there's, I mean, but it's nothing to aspire to. So we have to be careful, I think, in our own self-conception. Um, certainly, you know, like I, I remember watching Hitchens like 2006, 2007, and, and we got a lot from these debates uh, around the Iraq war, right? And so we, we had our moment with, with that. Um, but ultimately, we're not trying to reconstitute some kind of new right wing movement, you know, like ex Marxists that go to the right, um, which Richard also points out in that in that article in that presentation, right? That that's always like a kind of danger, um, you know. I I just don't want to have this um, the repetition of like, well, you know, maybe the left didn't leave Hitchens. You know, or rather, Hitchens didn't leave the left, but the left left him. Um, because if that happened already then, you know, like we should know better, right? Like we're not going to make the same mistake and sort of misrecognize. But we're not interested in the right because, as Kolakowski says, you know, it's the left that's led by utopia and it's the right response. Um, but because the left has, I mean, we. What are? Who are we? Sorry. I mean, I'm. I am sort of struck since it's the end of the series. Um, by who's going to, to listen to this series and what's going to happen with this um, knowledge that we've provided? What kind of historical education that we're given to new generations and how we can provoke the desire to learn? Um, and that's that's a real problem. But I don't think we should go looking for it in right wing circles. If I could just follow up quickly. Um, yes, we always recognize that someone like Christopher Hitchens was right wing. Um, in other words, uh, that was always clear to us. But we also um, recognized, and this is really, you know, the stakes of my Gilded Age article and the whole question of progressive liberalism versus conservative liberalism and where does socialism fit into that, um, that we've also recognized that ever since you could say, uh, FDR, in fact, uh, certainly since the new left, that um, the degree to which the left abandons uh, 
the struggle for freedom, then uh, that's expressed by the right. That's expressed by the right. And that's why there's the whole question of the new right, uh, neoliberalism and neoconservatism, both of which have roots uh, before they emerge in the 1970s as a strong political force and feed into the Reagan revolution, but they long predate that. And I always like to point out that um, in a very literal sense, uh, the neoliberals and neoconservatives are defectors from the Democratic Party. Uh, in other words, the Reagan revolution is really about um, a dissent and defection from the ruling New Deal, liberal, uh, progressive liberal Democratic Party. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, there's a kind of a famous, um, I think, uh, the Mount Perlin Society, I forget if it's uh, Ludwig von, von Mises, right, who's a kind of a classical liberal kind of libertarian type, and he shows up and he screams, you're all socialists, to people like um, Hayek and Milton Friedman and, and these people, the, the ordo liberals who become the neoliberals, um, because they are, had already accepted uh, the prominent role of the state um, in society. Uh, they had already given in to progressive liberal capitalism even though they were dissenters from it in certain respects, they had already conceded to it too much and therefore were already socialists. So this, this problem um, is really a longstanding one. And I think it's the, the one on which uh, the millennial left was defeated. Um, that longstanding question of how is socialism fundamentally different from progressive liberal capitalism? I think it's also worth pointing out that um, many of the leading intellectual figures of neoconservatism and neoliberalism in their inceptions up to their ascendancy uh, were not only former Democrats, but also former socialists, communists, and Trotskyists, um, and, and really an astounding number of them, actually, um, when, you, when you look into it. Um, but I also wanted to address the, the question um, why doesn't platypus start talking to the right? I think it's worth recognizing that to the extent that we're talking to anyone with a developed political perspective of any kind, we're talking to the right because there is no left. To the extent that, of course, the question's really asking, why don't we start talking to the avowed right? In other words, people who embrace the legacy of the political right wing of conservatism as something to uphold, but our entire perspective on the nature of the distinction between the left, right, and platypus is informed by Kolakowski's recognition that the right doesn't have a positive content unto itself, but it's defined by its opportunistic appropriation of whatever ideas and really tactics are necessary to accommodate itself to the prevailing status quo. Um, you know, so, but, and for that matter, to the extent that people still embrace the legacy of the left today, they embrace it for right-wing reasons, for conservative reasons, and even reactionary reasons. And, um, you know, I mean, you only need to look at how many people under the age of 30 today uh, on the internet will embrace, uh, you know, Stalin as a regular revolutionary figure, for example. Um, but, you know, I think that's not necessarily, um, a, that doesn't mean addressing people that are attached to the legacy of the left, uh, is a dead end. I mean, if that were a dead end, it would kind of make our project, it would put a question mark as to whether our project is worth pers pursuing into the future at all. Um, I, I'm always reminded um, when thinking about this question of the Socialist Party of America's platform of, I believe it was 1904, in which the Socialist Party announced its, itself to the American public by embracing the legacy of the American Revolution and the, the defense of the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and declared itself with respect to this tradition as the only conservative force defending this legacy in the country. In other words, explicitly embracing con the conservatism of its appeal, but not, in, as it were, because uh, simply preserving the status quo is necessary. In other words, they saw conservative as a conservative um a conservative attitude towards this legacy as itself revolutionary and of course that raises this question of whether people on the avowed right are embracing things like say the american revolutionary tradition um for 
revolutionary reasons against the presumed uh, or the perceivedly reactionary role of socialism and communism as simply a statist uh, absorption of society and 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 tyranny over the public and so on. So you know, I just want to just want to point out that people embracing the left today are not the left. <laughs> you know, there's a reason we refer to them as the dead left. They aren't the left. And people that embrace the right today, maybe they do want to embrace the left at some level, at least maybe some of them, but we're not going to make that appeal by engaging them as the right and in terms of the tradition of the right. It's only by pointing out how perhaps some of the things that they are themselves laying claim to are really legacies of the left and not the right. Yeah, let me just clarify. Obviously, we think that the existing left is an obstacle to the possibility of socialism, you know. Um, but I think that when we talk about the conservation of the, the freedom, American freedom, um, I just, I just want to emphasize again, I don't think we're going to find the, as Chris likes to put it, the human material for the future of Marxism um, in existing conservative circles. So we have to create the conditions because I think that's giving up on the mission of platypus as well, right? So like, oh, okay, so, you know, like the Gramsciist cultural Marxists in the universities are clearly like obstacles to the revolution, um, you know, but so are the, the young conservatives. So we, we can't, it's not like, well, one, you know, we're, we can win people over because they've been miseducated by the academic leftists. Um, so we'll move to this other milieu. That, that would undermine our own mission as well. The mission maybe is more difficult than we have to think about how to create the conditions for future generation of leftists. But the mission is the left. But just to respond to the earlier question about um, the difference. Real, real quick, Spencer, um, while you're, just before you say this, I just want to note that I'm being kind of, um, Richard is hurriedly mes messaging me to ask you if platypus is in danger of becoming right wing. And since we're having this discussion, just know that that's in the air, I guess. But go ahead, Spencer. I just wanted to get that in so that we can go to other questions after this. Uh, I just wanted to, to point the, well, there, there's sort of a connection between these two questions. Right, the idea of like talking to the right, meaning um, not talking to Democrats. Uh, you know, the question of like, you know, I feel like embedded in that is this issue of- Democrats the, are the right though, right? The liquidation of the left into the Democratic Party and to connect that to the issue of uh, the FDR coalition, um, you know, abandoning its Dixiecrat basis, which is that you know, when the Democrats become the party of governance in the United States, when they replace the Republicans, which is after, you know, more than half a century at the federal level, that the whole project of redemption and Jim Crow uh, was essentially um, at odds with the federal government. Uh, under the Republicans, uh, until uh, the F in, until FDR uh, constitutes the Democratic Party as the party of governance in the United States, and in that sense, uh, really brings the legacy of treason uh, to the American Revolution into the heart of the state. Um, that legacy of treason endures after the Dixiecrats leave, <laughs> right? And that's what we mean when we say that we live under the government that was erected by the New Deal that was only modified uh, in, you know, un under neoliberalism uh, as much as, you know, I mean, there are other emphases involved in that too, but uh, that was not changed by the new left's transformation of the constituency basis of party politics in the United States. Right. The Northern Democratic Party, uh, which continues, is also the party of the um, anti-draft riots during the Civil War, um, in which Blacks were set upon by violent mobs. Yep. Okay. Uh, thanks, everybody. Richard, I see your hand. We have other questions that were submitted before it went up, so I'm going to ask those, but if we have time, I'll recognize you at the end to speak. Um, so, Tom Cannell. 
uh, says, to the extent that we recognize that Marxism should be judged by the standards of 1776, rather than that 1776 should be judged by the standards of Marxism, are we not relinquishing Marxism as the determinant of our philosophical, historical, and political perspectives? And then he also includes a compliment to all the panelists. Well, 1776 can't survive unaltered uh, in capitalism. So uh, again, the question is, you know, what does Marxism mean to um, bourgeois freedom? Is it the negation of bourgeois freedom? Or is it rather the fulfillment of bourgeois freedom? Um, well, really, that's the question of capitalism. I think that Reed pointed out that um, the fact that during the Cold War, the United States became the upholder of capitalism submerged the question of bourgeois freedom in a particular way. Um, I guess I would modify something you know, ab about that, which is to say that in the Cold War, the East Bloc called the West Bloc the fascist bloc. And the, the, the West called the Eastern Bloc red fascism. So they both um, uh, upheld the revolution, but accused the other of betraying the revolution. Uh, so that, that second part is really important. Um, and so, you know, again, in this respect, um, you know, we, we have to be careful about um, a sense of priority. Um, so Marxism re remains important insofar as capitalism is a specific problem. If, however, capitalism is not a specific problem, in other words, if the problem of today's society is not capitalism, but white supremacy, for example, right, then neither 1776 nor Marxism are relevant. So our point is that Marxism is only relevant if we're living in bourgeois society in crisis in capitalism and not living in white supremacy. If we're living in white supremacy, then of course Marxism is irrelevant because the bourgeois revolution is irrelevant. I have a question now from Ethan Linehan. Um, he says, perhaps for James First and others, uh, in what ways do the bourgeois revolutionaries give license to the self-transformation of their own movement? Marxism may be incoherent from their perspective, um, in parentheses, pre-crisis, pre-industrial revolution, but I assume they still had a sense uh, that this revolution would last beyond them. In what ways? Um, my straightforward answer would be yes, they give a license to the self-transformation self of what they're creating. Um, if you go back, one of the, the documents I assigned for the, I can't remember, it was the first, it must have been the second lecture, George Washington's circular letter to um, on disbanding the troops in 1783 of the Continental Army. You know, he essentially says something that, that, that was popularized by Christopher Hitchens, since we mentioned him so much on this in, in our own era, but he says this was the first Enlightenment revolution, right? Washington makes that clear. This is the first revolution founded on the Enlightenment. And we have a view of the Enlightenment um, largely thanks to postmodernism, as if though what is being suggested is that there's some achievement of a final end state, right? Of a final eternal state. No, it's not at all, right? One of the central conclusions of the Enlightenment is we're on a ship at sea and we don't have a compass or map that somebody else gives it us to figure out where we're going. We're going to have to together, the passengers on this ship, figure out where we're going. And who knows what lands or areas we'll rise to? Who knows what freedom makes possible? I mean, no, the Enlightenment and, and the, 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 the American Revolution as the really the, the first and only lasting achievement politically of the Enlightenment is precisely an open-ended process. And, and also think back to Chris's lecture on Jefferson, right? And, and, and the quotes he gave about the mystery of, of the Declaration of Independence, the pursuit of happiness. He didn't say the promise of happiness. He only promised its pursuit. Because to promise happiness would have been to promise finitude, some definite sense of what life could be for us as individuals and collectively together. 
the pursuit of happiness is an open-ended pursuit. It's infinitude. It's infinity. There's an open-ended sense. And so, of course, um, and to speak of this in a more mundane way, the Constitution is not meant to be a once and for all Ten Commandments tablet, right? It's meant to be a framework for society constantly transforming itself. And there was an expectation by many of them that, that there would be, in fact, further revolutions. And so, yes, I, I think they absolutely do give a license to, to, to continuing transformation. I would, um, I would point to Kant, who said, we don't live in an enlightened age, but in an age of enlightenment. In other words, the process of enlightenment is constantly ongoing. It's a constant process of overcoming our self-incurred immaturity rather than finally um, putting an end to that process. We live in an age in which that process is unfolding. And of course, he also said that the achievement of a universal cosmopolitan civil society would only be the halfway mark in the process of human history um, rather than its end state the halfway mark that we have yet to even re reach in his day. Yeah, Chris likes to quote the letter from Jefferson to Fanny Wright uh, about the experiments in freedom. And you can see that Jefferson is open, right, to considering the, the goals of the revolution in new, a sort of new social conditions of the 19th century. Um, yeah, I think that that's lost to people somehow. Um, I just, I wanted to respond to the question before and, and the way that Chris responded to, you know, whether we're living in capitalism or um, white supremacy, because I was, I just uh, watched the police brutality panel again, which I would encourage everyone to do. It's an excellent panel. And Andrea Pritchett, who, you know, is ostensibly the sort of like liberal on the panel. Um, she's a community organizer and Ephraim, our moderator, was pushing her to consider, like, what is the police as, like, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a problem um, that there's unemployment and there's criminality, and so there's the police, um, and she, like, rejected this formulation, and she said, you know, well, the police, it, it just sort of predates capitalism, you know, it's just in any kind of society that's built in a hierarchy and compulsion, and, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be coupled with, with capitalism. And it, there, I, I, I was, I, I thought, wow, like, you know, there is no recognition that we live in a new epoch, um, that, like, James's first two lectures, I think, were both like very exciting for the viewers, but also kind of baffling because this proposition that he was putting forth was about an epochal transformation. And I find sometimes that that is the most difficult argument to make as a platypus member when you're speaking to someone, when you're appealing to their reason that capitalism is bourgeois society in crisis. And it's not just like the extension of compulsion and hierarchy. Um, and I wonder to what extent that makes our sort of thesis of the American Revolution um, a difficult one, that, that there's a fundamental sort of misrecognition about the epochal transformation that makes the American Revolution possible, and that people just see it as an expression of a kind of hierarchical oppressive system, and we're kind of stuck in making, making the claims that we make. Anyway, it just made me think because, you know, the liberals are being brought up, right? And we did have like a liberal panelist and we couldn't get this very basic point across. Thanks, Pam. I'm gonna recognize Richard now um, as we draw to the close of our time. Richard, you're up. So I just wanna push on the question that I raised. Like, so is platypus in any danger of becoming right wing? or if one accepts the diagnosis that everything is right wing because the left is dead, is platypus in some sense already right wing like everything else? And I, I sort of wanted a more direct answer to that. Um, I think in our founding documents, I think it was in what is a platypus, um, or one of the founding documents, we recognize that platypus itself is part of the dead left and can't distinguish itself as if we're somehow free of the problem that um, that the dead left exhibits in its kind of- But surely we show different symptoms. Sure, I mean, I think we would aspire to attain a level of self-consciousness of the problem that is not present among um, 
the left. So is the, quest, the right is side. the question is Platypus in danger of becoming right wing on this place question? I think the danger is that we simply remain beholden to the problem of being assimilated into the status quo and being right wing in that sense. Um, but we're not going to be able to overcome that problem. We can only register the problem and raise consciousness of it. Overcoming that problem is not something that we can do because we're not a political project seeking to reconstitute the left directly. Um, at least that's, that's my take on it. I would say also that the colloquial sense of right wing, and I think it came up, uh, Reed, you brought up um, the avowed conservatism of the Socialist Party of America and its 1904 platform, meaning that it sought to conserve the values of the American Revolution. Um, when Platypus first started um, at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and at the University of Chicago simultaneously, the students at SAIC um, who were involved in, in starting Platypus uh, were told by one of my colleagues, one of the faculty members there, uh, oh, Platypus is trying to take us back 50 years. Right, so conservative in that sense. And, and my response to that was, a hell of a lot longer than that. <laughs> like, I want to take us back uh, 100 years. Um, and uh, so in this respect, um, you know, built into our project is an emphasis on the question of history and how the past critiques the present, how the past surpasses the present, um, and consciousness of that. And I think in a colloquial sense, we're already seen as conservative or as reactionary. So I'm, I'm often called a reactionary. And what's meant by that is that I want to take the left back to some older style, pre, you know, more precisely before the new social movements, right? Because that's what's meant, right? Whether it's 50 years or 100 years, the accusation is uh, undo the new left. Yes, right? And so is that right wing? What, what, what would be right wing about that, right? Especially if, um, if the Socialist Party of America was trying to reclaim 1776 in 1904, does that mean that they want to uh, turn back the 19th century? Well, of course, in some ways they do, meaning they want to overcome the uh, effects of capitalism, right? And we want to overcome the effects of the 20th century. Absolutely. But again, as Reed just pointed out, because we're not a political project, um, we're not, we never aimed to do it ourselves but rather to perform a necessary function uh, in facilitating the possibility of that happening. I mean, there is um, the thesis of regression, right? So Platypus doesn't just want to go back. It has to cope with, right? We're not the Spartacists. We're not just gonna uphold orthodoxy and mischaracterize the barbarism that has been accumulated through the 20th century. And so that also leaves us in a, um, in a difficult position. In some respects, it would be easier if we just sort of upheld Lenin somehow, right? But it's Lenin, Trotsky, Luxembourg, and Adorno. And um, I guess that part of the equation, how we deal with the regression, the, the deep regression that we find ourselves in, how, how does the Adorno part of our project um, impact how we now act in civil society is something that is coming up, I guess, um, for us today. Like, how do we actually make inroads given that the regression is so deep? Um, so sure, conservative, not right wing, but also recognizing that there's something new in the present as a result of regression. I think that Adorno called this the dialectic of um, uh, progressive and conservative. Uh, viewpoints. Um, and also, of course, we should, we should just admit that Adorno is usually seen as right wing, right, or, or at least conservative, right. So he's, he's seen as, but he's seen as right wing in the sense of uh, a kind of cultural Mandarin, someone stuck in the 19th century, uh, very anachronistically, because of course, he's a 20th century person. Um, and so, uh, also, though, you know, it's interesting, often Lenin is characterized as someone who is some kind of holdover from the 19th century as well, as a, you know, as a kind of um, conservative bourgeois type of, of person and sensibility. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's all very loaded. And, you know, we, again, the, the legacy of the new left is actually quite deep in the sense that um, 
the left is seen as necessarily countercultural. And if you're not countercultural, then you're right wing, then you're conservative in a pejorative sense. And that is the legacy of the new left's own antinomianism, its own counterculture, but also more politically, it's also the way that the cultural revolution, the Maoist cultural revolution was taken up as some kind of model, very broadly, very broadly. And I, I just wanna say that I think it's, it's unfortunate that this question should arise in relation to a lecture series on the American Revolution. Um, it, and, and I think it uh, relates somewhat, I don't know if we're gonna get to the question that Ethan has in the, in the Q&A, um, this idea that um, judging Marxism from the perspective of the American Revolution means judging Marxism from the perspective of bourgeois revolution and from the perspective of liberalism. Uh, because I think that's tr very tricky uh, because it assumes that those categories are available in some mm. obvious way that bourgeois revolutionary thought or liberalism uh, exists. And, this refers, I think, to the way, to, to what Pam was talking about before, the idea that there might be liberals to talk to. Um, whereas, in fact, there really is no such thing as a liberal. Uh, what there are, what there is, is bourgeois social relations and the kind of thoughts that people incoherently and in fragments and in shards uh, come back to. Uh, you know, but it's never a coherent liberalism. Um, and, 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 and that's why, you know, even in the 19th century, this was understood and it was understood in the American revolution. I mean, this, if you look at the, the documents that the reason I selected the particular documents that I selected in relation to my lecture, uh, especially from Abraham Lincoln is that Lincoln is recognizing that something wrong has happened that liberalism is somehow in crisis, that something is, as regards slavery was the most obvious symptom of this, that the way in which it was set in train of ultimate extinction in the revolution had failed, had been reversed. He didn't think now we have to take this, we have to take on this beast and set it in train of ultimate extinction because it's a, it's a task that was ignored. It was a task that was addressed in all sorts of ways. And I think Pam brought this up in some of her questions to, to Chris uh, in uh, the third lecture in the series, uh, things like you know, the Northwest Ordinance and many, many other examples of the way in which um, this was the legacy of the 18th century. So I think in my own lecture, I, I mentioned the fact that Lincoln thought that the idea that you would expand slavery into new territories was something foreign, as he put it, not only to all the signers of the Constitution and all of the, all of the revolutionary patriots, but as he said, to everybody in the 18th century. <laughs> in, the, in the Cooper Union speech. So I just want to clarify again that I was not saying that there are liberals to talk to, but that in 2009, when Richard wrote this article, that he was reflecting on how we understood our own intervention in civil society, that there's a reason why, for example, Danny Postel was in our panel, right? That we thought that he was like the red lib, you know, not the upholder of some kind of uh, classical liberal tradition, but that among the left, that we were also speaking to these people and that it would help us sort of triangulate a conversation of our, our intervention. And I guess I was just trying to contrast that moment of the founding of the organization and, and Richard's article to 2020, where like the ostensible Brad Libs, right, are like the New York Times and, you know, part of, I guess, the constituency of the DSA and how maybe we've misdiagnosed like how this rad lib milieu was going to help us advance the mission of platypus because here they are in the post Obama moment completely collapsed and undoing some of the values that at one point they seem to be so uh, married to, right? I mean, uh, 
uh, having like civil society discourse, um, free exchange of ideas, um, uh, you know, sort of basic, basic things. And that, that leaves us with, with a new terrain, you know, but I just want to clarify, I'm not saying like platypus, we should go and find the, like the real liberals or something. Um, but that is what the red libs look like now. And they're not really doing us any service. And I'm not sure if, you know, I mean, we're certainly not talking to them. I mean, this, 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 this lecture really, you know, um, they don't care about 1776, but it does leave us with the question who we're talking to, um, right? I would just say that uh, even when Richard invoked the Nation magazine, right, as uh, the right wing of the left and the Spartacists as the left wing of the left, um, the Nation magazine was no longer what it used to be. So Adolf Reed, my old mentor, used to write for the Nation, but then he had a falling out um, with um, Katrina Vanden Heuvel. Um, and the editorial mandate of the Nation magazine became more inimical to an Adolf Reed perspective. Um, and, you know, he saw that as a, a caving in to the racial politics of the Democratic Party, which, of course, it was. Um, and so when we see, you know, uh, uh, Kianga Yamhada Taylor uh, writing for New the New Yorker, and we see Bhaskar Sankara writing regularly op-eds in the New York Times, right? I think that it's nothing new. I think that rather something has been revealed that already was the case when Platypus started out. And of course, when we said that the left was dead uh, when we started out in 2006, 2007, we were saying liberalism, social democrats, um, Marxists, you know, Trotskyists, Maoists, anarchists, they were all, right, uh, dead in this respect. Um, you know, the broad left, the reason that we wanted to include the broad left was to include all of the symptoms of the death of the left in our consideration of the historical legacy of, of the the failure of Marxism and the uh, disintegration, liquidation of, of socialism. Um, I, I do want to um, second uh, Spencer's point that it's it's very unfortunate um, if if we allow um, the suspicion that the very topic of the American Revolution is somehow right wing. Well, I'm certainly not saying that. I don't know if Richard's saying that. I don't think anyone's saying that actually. But um, it does mean that, that sort right of, right. yeah, I don't, I don't think you're saying that. But, but the breakdown of the symptomology of the red libs in that broader left means a difficult terrain for us. And so I, I think that we need to recognize that, right? We were never talking to Danny Postel to try to turn him into a platypus member, but he certainly did something on the panel. Um, and he's just one example. And I just think that the fact that there is a disintegration of that part of the left means that I don't know, the work that we're doing, um, it raises new questions about how to present the problem of Marxism. And I think that we, it's not about like steadying the road or just sort of moving ahead, but we have to consider how we make our intervention, what it means to talk about the defeat of the left in, in the 20th century. Um, yeah. I think that there, at the time of the founding of Platypus, there were a lot of of symptoms of a with the notion that there was a spectrum between the nation and Spartacus League. Uh, people like Andrew Orato, uh, who's since been cancel cultured, uh, been canceled um, at his own university, uh, the New School in New York City, people like Paul Berman um, that we were thinking about in, in, in proto-platypus period, in the proto-platypus period. Um, a member of the nation who, uh, the kind of the nation stable of writers, if I'm not mistaken, uh, who was voicing extreme skepticism around the anti-war movement. Uh, in a different way than Hitchens, uh, who also was a writer for the nation at the time that uh, that Adolf Reed was writing for it. Uh, and so there were a whole range of, of phenomena at that time 
um, that um, you know didn't take the 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 Bush administration war in Iraq plunge that Hitchens took, uh, but in many ways signaled a kind of discontent that we're seeing now, um, that foreshadowed what we're seeing now, uh, in terms of you know deep reservations about the jettisoning of, 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 of or, or really hostility towards the legacy of the American Revolution. And we wouldn't have seen, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I mean, what's changed is, is I, I think, the remarkable fact that, uh, that Donald Trump got up and gave a speech a few months ago declaring that the Democratic Party was hostile to the American Revolution and it was essentially unanswered by the Democratic Party. You know, that just was, you know, that that's like a one-sided conversation um, is kind of a incredible. Uh, and, and, and I think that indicates a, a, a sea change, which for us, we, we experience as the passing of a generation, right? So I guess what I would say, Pam, is that, um, I'm not quite sure, you know, that, that what the millennials think today or the Zoomers is as stably held. Uh, it's a legacy of the, of the new left uh, that's undigested and, and, and less coherent. And, and maybe there's some kind of opportunity in that incoherence. They did answer by saying that in choosing to speak before in front of Mount Rushmore, he was pandering to white supremacy. Okay. Thanks everyone. I think we should uh, wrap up on that note. Um, if anybody wants to get in a final word, we can do that, but otherwise I think we can end. Okay, great. Thank you everybody for attending our panel discussion and all of the preceding lectures. You can find them all online on YouTube. Um, our YouTube page is search for the Platypus Affiliated Society and then on our you know, user page, you can find the American Revolution lectures and very soon this. Um, just as a reminder, if you want to find our virtual activities or get in touch uh, with members of Platypus, go to platypus1917.org forward slash virtual. Um, thank you. Yeah, I just, I just wanna thank everybody, all my co-panelists, uh, including James, who's gone. It's been a pleasure and an honor to be a part of this with you together. Seconded. Thanks. Bye, everyone.